9988, exercise 2213. Starts at the bottom of that page and spills onto the top of 989. Without reading the paragraph at the bottom of 988, I'm going to just glance at and read to you the instructions at the top of 989. Prepare an absorption costing income statement, prepare a variable costing income statement, and explain the difference of the two net income amounts. Appropriate or not? <coughs> Would it be good to review or not? Yes. I've got the solution right here, which means it's on the website. It would be something that you could do on your own. We did that on Monday. We did it on Tuesday. We had the opportunity to do it today. I thought it might be overkill to do it. Did you hear me? But I want to get the message out. This one would be a good one. And it has ending inventory. So it would be better than the one we did on Monday, maybe. I'm choosing to do brief exercise 26.3. I'm hoping you'll turn there with me. Page 1157. 1157? Woo! Look here. Oh my word. Y'all see what I'm showing here. Look at that. There's not, there's not much of this book left. That's a good thing. It's brief exercise 26.3. It says in K Company, it costs $30 per unit, 20 variable and 10 fixed, to make a product that normally sells for 45 a foreign wholesaler offers to buy 4,000 units at $23 each. We will incur special shipping costs of a dollar per unit, assuming that we have excess operating capacity, indicate the net income or net loss that we would realize by accepting this special order. How shall we approach this? Yeah. Find the cost of the unit first. And how, what might that be? Uh, 4,000 units that they want to buy times your cost would be $30 per unit. 20 plus 10 is 30. 30 times 4,000 units we would have to produce in order to sell them to them. Y'all yeah. like Jeff's answer? Yeah. I heard a yes out of somebody. Was somebody over here that liked Jeff's answer? Okay. You like it? Yeah. You like Jeff's answer, Nick? Sure. You like Jeff's answer, Chriselle? Yeah. Yes. Do I have any dissenters? Anybody that doesn't like <coughs> Jeff's answer? Actually, maybe we should do $31 for the special shipping cost. Jeff doesn't like Jeff's answer. Yeah, I don't know. Jeff? We're, we're thinking multiple choice, aren't we here? So that first answer was a good multiple choice, right, Jeff? Yeah. You want to offer another multiple choice? $31 per unit. $31? I don't see $31 here anymore. $30 per unit plus the $1. Oh, $31. Oh, I see that. Mm -hmm. mm, Y'all like $31 better than you did $30? Yeah. Yes. With? You thinking? Yes. What are you liking? A or B? 30 or 30? Not quite sure. Yeah. Not quite sure. <laughs> but you're sure that you're glad you came to class today? Yes. Tucker, you thinking any? Um, no, you're not thinking. <laughs> you're in production mode? I need you to think, Tucker. Shane, you with me or not? I'm not with you. Would you get with me? I need you. I need you. Richard, you thinking or not? Just reading the problem. Just reading the problem. I already read you the problem. Sam? What? You're thinking. You like Jeff's $30? Jeff's $31. I 
maybe five multiple choices or four at least. Let's let's suggest some others. Y'all gonna leave that up to me? I'm thinking twenty dollars or twenty one dollars or ten dollars or eleven dollars. Oops, six multiple choices won't fit on the scantron sheet. Brandy, your hand was up. Okay. $23, One more time. The to buy. To buy. Yeah, Jeff took us down this cost path. Right. So, go ahead. And so, if you wanted to figure out how much their proposal would be, yeah, you would get the variable cost per unit based upon what they want to do. Before we go that way, maybe we need to talk about this point here. If the best two answers are 30 and 31, and they want to buy this from us for 23, then I think we reject this offer pretty pronto. Randy, yes or no? I'm not willing to incur 30, 31 dollars for cost and sell this product for 23 and cut my own throat. Randy. Jeff, feeling uncomfortable, Jeff, yeah. or comfortable in rejecting the offer? Comfortable in rejecting. Ah, uh -huh. Eloisa. But well, wouldn't you already have? You would have, would have already have it on the last day of class, Eloisa. You're paying fixed already. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> you just you just had to turn it into a question, didn't you, yeah. Eloisa? You're gonna pay for the variable cost of that, but not the fixed. So you're saying the variable costs are relevant to this decision and the fixed costs are not relevant to this decision. Is that what you're telling me, Eloisa? Yeah. Tucker had his hand up. So I'm, got something he wants to say. I'm thinking the cost is going to be $21. $21 of my six multiple choices. With? Um, this is, so um, in the first sentence, it's saying um, $20 variable cost and $10 fixed costs. So, for example, if we sold three units, it would be 20 times 3 plus 10? Or is it 3 well, times 3? right now we're selling at almost full capacity. Well, so, I'm whatever we're selling right now is uh, has the job of covering our fixed cost. A different way to look at that would be if I sold three of these twenty, uh, these 4,000 proposed, what cost would I incur to in, to produce those three? Your your example. I would incur $20 variable cost, a dollar to ship them, right. and how many additional fixed costs? I don't know. Shane's hand was up. Hang with me here. Did you have something you wanted to say? Yeah. Um. <laughs> I feel like we've gone off topic now. But well, that's all right. You said what you want to say. I mean, all I was going to say is that all that's relevant is that it costs you $21 per unit, including the shipping, and you're getting 23 so you're making $2 a unit. Our and fixed cost relevant, <coughs> excuse me, our fixed cost relevant to this decision? Not at all. Why? Because they're fixed, and they're, we're talking about the short term. Whether we accept or reject this proposal, fixed costs are going to be the same. This is one of those problems that we wanted to demonstrate this decision thing that we've been trying to do for two or three weeks now. The difference in fixed cost and variable cost and how they behave and when they're relevant and when they're not. To stay in business, to provide an overall profit, we've got to cover all our costs, including fixed. But for some certain kinds of decisions like this one, accept or reject some additional business, Fixed costs are irrelevant. They are not part of this decision. Therefore, I mean, the, unless you have to increase your fixed costs. Well, but it says there's capacity well, here. Yeah, that was covered, but you're right. If we are at full capacity, we don't have that luxury. But we have some unused plant capacity, and we have the ability to sell this product for not the full price we normally do, not the whole 45 we normally get, this might be an attractive offer that would help us out. So, Brandy says, if we accepted the offer and earned the additional $23 of revenue, what cost would we incur? 
variable cost of? Uh, <coughs> I think it's 20. Do you see it or not? I don't mean on the screen, I mean in the book. Do you? And fixed cost of? Didn't hear you. 10. Fixed cost of how much, David? Tucker. Zero. Eve. Eloisa. Fixed cost right here, Eloisa. Come on. Here. Why would I write fixed cost up there if it was zero? <laughs> what did you say? Surely 30 <laughs> <laughs> Oh, and shipping. One. We're going to make how much per unit? What's the name of that? What's the name of that? Y'all are mumblers. What's the name of that? Contribution margin. We'd have contribution margin per unit of $2, sell 4,000 of them, make $8,000, and be happy about it. Be glad about it. This is review week. We covered this previously. Was it good that we reviewed it just now? Say yes or no. Yes. You forgot. Or you don't know it well enough. And maybe now you do. We did something else similar to that. Look at, yes, Whit. I'm still a little confused as to the, like, the wording in the first sentence. Okay. Um, it's, uh, I, don't, I don't know, never mind. Help me out. I don't, I'm so confused. What's it saying, $10 fixed per unit? That's what we're incurring on so, current production. Oh, okay. The goods that we produce right oh, now I cost see. us twenty dollars variable and ten fixed. I see. That. We're okay. allocating all our fixed costs over our current production. Okay. So, so then so the, the temptation is, do we continue to allocate those fixed costs to even more production? That's short term nature. That's not going to be what we sell at our regular price. Okay. This is additional one time business. <coughs> to do, sometimes it'll say. Um, we're going to export it to a foreign group. Does it say anything about who's going to buy this? A foreign wholesaler. Thank you. Uh, okay, let, let's embellish it a bit. Let, let's think it through. Let's add a, a little spice to this. So, is this proposal one that would cause us to sell to this person who's going to be the generic provider at the local store where the shopper walks up to the shelf and there's their product sitting right next to our product, are these two products going to sell for the same amount on the shelf? No. Unlikely. You agree? Mm -hmm. Is that what this problem says? We're going to sell to somebody who's going to compete with us and sell their product head to head with us? Yes or no? No. 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 These goods are not going to be on the shelf competing for our products. Our products are safe on that shelf and the demand for them would still be the same. These products are going to be shipped someplace else and not compete with ours. That's part of the problem. That's part of the consideration. That's part of the reason that we can do what we're proposing to do. Whit? Okay. Is yeah, it getting I, better? I understand. No. It's additional business. Short-term decision, not a long-term decision. Look at 26-7 with me, the brief exercise. Same page, down the way just a bit. We manufacture golf clubs in three models. For the year, the Golden Eagle line has a net loss, oops, oops, a net loss of $20,000 from sales of 200,000, variable expenses 180,000, fixed expenses 40,000. If the Golden Eagle line is eliminated, 34,000 of fixed costs will remain. Prepare an analysis showing whether the Golden Eagle line should be eliminated. Well, when I did similar things to this in the week we covered this, I told you what you were about to see on the screen was not the textbook solution. And I don't think that what you're about to see is either. <coughs> but I think we should consider 
<coughs> keeping and eliminating this product. And I think we could think in variable costing terms. That's been the theme since the last test. So let's do us a variable costing income statement based on what we know if we keep the product and then do it if we eliminate the product. Let's don't go line by line. Let's do all of one before we do the other one. What revenue would we earn from this product if we kept this product? Jeff, start us out. 200000 It says so in the problem, doesn't it, Jeff? Mm -hmm. No calculations necessary. What cost would we incur if we continue to produce and sell this product? May I have a new volunteer other than Jeff? Aaron? You said what cost were available? Could you name me some costs that we would incur? Uh, if we kept it variable and fixed. Variable of how much? $180,000 of variable cost would be incurred. Therefore, contribution margin would be $20,000. $20, and fixed cost would be, Dustin? $40,000 stated in the problem. If we keep this product, we're going to be losing $20,000. This reminds me of the exercise we did where we produce lots of things. Some are more profitable than others. We have our favorites. We have our least favorite. This problem says we produce three product lines. This one is unprofitable. We hope the others are profitable. Yes? Yes. Then let's rethink it. If we eliminate this product, Sales from this product will be how much wit? Uh, zero. If we eliminate this product, variable cost on this product will be how much, Alexis? Zero. And contribution margin will be how much, class? Zero. And fixed cost will be how much, some volunteer hand up? Tucker? 40,000. Mm -hmm. Tucker's at a disadvantage. Mm -hmm. okay. Dustin? <coughs> 34,000. It said in the problem, Tucker, that if we eliminated the product, we, we could eliminate some of the fixed cost, oh, which okay. would be unusual. They would be 34,000, the ones we couldn't eliminate. Therefore, net income would be, net loss would be 34,000. Now, we would have thought an un un uninformed, uneducated person would have thought that we would have been better off without this product. Yes? You're losing money. $20,000. But as it turns out, we're worse off eliminating it. Net loss is $34,000 where it was $20,000. How come? Why? Somebody explain to me. Shane? That's a positive contribution. It has a contribution margin. Want to elaborate on that? Um, because it has a contribution margin, um, that contribution margin can be applied to fixed costs. It's helping. Um, it's reducing our overall expenses. It is helping us cover fixed costs. It's contributing to the overall good of the company. We would be worse off because we would lose that $20,000 of contribution margin. It's helping. Even though it's not able to cover all the fixed costs, it's helping. Now, by this time, I've worked some other good exercise that was better than this one. Okay? That's why you need to review the ones we've already worked in class. But this is a good illustration of a kind of decision that could be based on variable costing. This keep or eliminate a product line. If this says we make one product and we're losing money, we're thinking about going out of business, can variable costing help us make this decision because we're covering all our, all our variable costs? No. If you're producing one product, that product has to cover all its fixed costs too. This works because there are other products there that can also absorb the fixed cost. We can 
but we can keep this product and be better off with it because it's contributing to the overall well-being of the company. Jeff? In the long run, wouldn't you want to make this line smaller though, slowly? Well, so we do want to solve it in the long run. I, I don't want to infer that this is an acceptable decision for the long run. We need to do something. We either need to promote this and sell more, we need to cut some costs, or we need to phase this one out and replace the productivity with something else that would be more profitable, or some other alternative we could come up with. I, I don't want to leave the, the discussion, thank you for doing that, with it's okay to always have an unprofitable segment around. No, this is in the short run. In the short run, we're better off with this. In the long run, we've got a problem and we need to solve it. Do you have a question about this, Shane? Not a question, but I remember sometime during the year you brought up uh, Mark Green um, and his um, uh, when he was running Camille's and pairing. That would be Steve Green. Uh, sorry, yeah. It's Steve okay. Green. Uh, when he was pairing soft drinks with sandwiches. Yeah. And I think this just is a great tying it back. You know, if I, I wish you could hear him tell the story. He, he tells it much more effectively than I do. But I'm telling you, when he first came around and when we first gleaned of his experience, because he was fresh from the real world, um, we were hanging on every word. And those of you that have had him in class may be exposed to that all the time. Um, it, did I tell you the turkey sandwich story? Only because you brought it up, I'm going to tell you. Okay? Um, I'm going to refresh your memory about what he said, and even in Monday's lecture, I remember saying, margins, 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 margins. Well, Steve Green, the dean, is one of those people that thinks, talks, evaluates, makes decisions based on margins. And his experience tells him that you've got to know your company well. You've got to rely on the accounting information. The system's got to work and provide you the information that you would know and you would be able to use and make decisions from all the time. Now, we're accustomed to going to a fast food establishment or any place for that matter, a lot of places, and buying a combo, McDonald's or Wendy's or Camille's, and buying a drink, a sandwich, chips or a side of some sort, fries, whatever it is. Then the question is, why did they bundle it that way and how are they better off because of that? Well, the sandwich probably costs the most. The drink probably costs the least. But if they can get us to buy it together for a reduced price, they may sell more and make more ultimately because they're making more on the drink than they are on the sandwich. That was essentially the story. Yes? And they try to find the right combination of those things to offer it to us to get us to buy the bundle instead of the a la carte items, and that's the way they make more. Now, the other story that goes with that from Steve Green's experience is, <coughs> so he's trained employees on the sandwich line. Have y'all eaten at Camille's? You know what I'm talking about? They make sandwiches to order. You order a sandwich, they're going to make it, you know, kind of deli style, okay? Um, so you've got a high school student trained to make this turkey sandwich. A group of, of his peers come in and he's making the sandwich and he sees that the next one is this person that ordered the turkey sandwich. And the high school employee thinks, Oh, I'll do my friend a favor and takes an extra slice of turkey and puts it on the sandwich. The margin, this is Steve Green talking, the margin on that turkey sandwich is so close that that one decision to put an extra slice of turkey on that sandwich made that go from profitable to unprofitable. That sandwich is no longer profitable going down that assembly line. The margins are so close. Now, that student didn't know that, but the manager of that store needs to know that. Needs to know the accounting information well enough, and it comes back to this very, very thing. That's a variable cost that got out of whack 
because that trained employee deviated from the policy of the company on how to make that sandwich. Well, if you don't know your accounting business, you don't know that that's happening. You may be the guy standing behind the counter training the high school kid and say, oh, just put this much on it and not realize whether you're making money on that sandwich or not if you don't know the cost that you're incurring. It's a good application of variable costing. Thanks for bringing it up. Did y'all learn something from that? Good. I'd like to sample some things, and that's exactly what we're doing with the two things that we've talked about. How about turning in your book with me to problem 20-5A? Uh, 901, thank you. 20-5A, page 901. Now we've gone way back. This is not current material. This is in the job order cost accounting chapter. Let's glance at this one. V Corporation's fiscal year ends November 30th. The following accounts are found in its job order accounting system for the first month of the new year. Raw materials, work in process, finished goods, factory labor, manufacturing, over at the top of the next page. Four items of other information that we'll need to know. I think I'll just let us look through those and scour for what we need later. And the instructions are, list the letters A through M and indicate the, the amount pertaining to each letter. Well, that doesn't make any sense to me. Let's glance back at page 901 at the bottom of the page. Would you let your eyes wander down through that information and find the letters A, B, C, D, E, F, and so forth? Do you see the missing letters? Yes or no? Yes. Yes, do you? Yes. Now, what's the point of this problem? This problem is a good review of the relationships that you saw in those three chapters, job order process and standard cost systems. We, we called it the flow of cost through the accounts. And you might be able to solve this on your own. But I might be able to help you solve this if I demonstrate it to, to you and you participate in the solution. I might could help you with an approach that you might take to find it a little easier. Let's look at just the raw materials account. Tell me whether this is a true statement. Is it true that A plus 19225 minus 18850 is equal to 79 Did I write the truth? Do you see how I took that information and converted it to this algebraic expression? And would you feel more comfortable solving that than you would looking at this and trying to work from that T account? Yes or no? Yes. Mm -hmm. Now, if you're not able to say yes to that, now would be a good time for you to ask me a question. A couple of you have a blank look on your face. Like, what? <laughs> Bentley, ask me a question. So, I mean, I see how, it, how the flow goes like the, the way that you put the numbers on the board, uh -huh. but it's just not making sense, like how you go from 19 to 18 to get seven. Okay, I, I, I'm worried, I, I'm not worried, I'm not sure I can answer it the way you ask it, but I'm trying to help you because I want you to be with me. All I'm doing is converting accounting information to a mathematical approach and algebraic expression. We should know enough now to know that two debits ought to be added together, A and 19,225. We should know enough about how an account works to know that a credit of 18,850 would be subtracted from the debits. And the ending balance should be the result of that. So that's what I did, Bentley. I took what I understand from an accounting perspective and wrote it as an algebraic expression that you would have a greater chance of solving accurately. Do you understand how I got what I got, Bentley? Yes. Somebody else want to ask me a question about this? Do I have to solve this one? Anybody solved it? Yeah. What'd you get? 7,600 7, is the answer. If you didn't do it yet and want to write down that check figure, do so. Because I want to turn up the heat just a little bit. I wanted to start out with an easy one. One that would be achievable. 
one that would get you in the right frame of mind. But I want to try <laughs> one that's a little harder. God bless you. So let's try the work in process account. Ooh, doggies. Look at this. Is it true, class, that B plus C plus $8,800 plus D minus F is equal to E? Is that what it says in the book? Yes or no? <laughs> Now, when y'all got really good at algebra, and they turned up the heat, wherever that was, middle school, high school, you thought you were hot stuff when you could solve for two unknowns, didn't you? How, 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 many, how many unknowns we got here, class? You know, that's, that's not really the question. The, the, the surprise here is how many gnomes do you have? We got one gnome. This is almost throw up your hands and quit. Except that's the very point of this exercise is about the relationships, is about what can we find? What else is here? Uh, for instance, look in raw materials. When $18,850 of raw materials left the material storeroom, where did they go? Some of them went into work in process, didn't they? Now, you got to look around and make sure before you jump to the conclusion that all of them went into work in process. How about glancing down at the manufacturing overhead account? Do y'all see in manufacturing overhead where indirect materials were 1900 yes or no? Yes. Yes. Well, 18,850 of materials left the material storeroom. 1,900 of them went into manufacturing overhead. Where did the rest of them go? Work in process. Letter... C. 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 Yes. Letter C. So I, I'm going to try to show my work a little bit. Let's say that C is 1850 minus 1900. Yeah. That would give me C. Are you with me? Yes or no? It's about the relationships. It's about reviewing what you might have understood at that point. Let's talk about B, the beginning balance. Well, that might be over in this other information at the top of page 902. Let's see if we can find it. Item 1. On December 1st, two jobs were in process. Job 154, job 155. These two jobs had combined direct materials cost of 9750 and direct labor cost of 15000 Aha. Uh -huh. I think we might have found it. 9750 plus 15,000. 9750 plus 15,000, the two jobs left over from last month summed would give us the beginning balance of this. Am I on the right track here? Have I made a mistake? No. I think that's letter B. Well, while we're on item one, it says overhead was applied at the rate of 80% of direct labor. Let's go back to the T accounts. How about going all the way to the bottom of the page and seeing the credit in manufacturing overhead labeled M? When manufacturing overhead was, a, was credited for letter M, what was the debit? D. Tucker. D. D is correct. I need you all to buy into this. You're supposed to know that the entry is debit work in process, credit manufacturing overhead. D and M should be the same. And I'm looking for D. Yes? Okay. It says in the problem, in item one on the next page, the overhead rate is, say it back to me, 80% of what? 
80% of labor. Do we know labor? Labor is how much? This 8,800 is labor. 8,800 times 80% 80 is 7040. One more time? 7040, is that what you're telling me? Mm -hmm. 7,040 is D, but is also M. You ought to write it there. Mm -hmm. Am I wasting your time? No. <coughs> We've got two unknowns. I've got F and I've got E. F is jobs completed. E is ending balance. Where can I find either of those information? Well, we haven't read everything in the, the information on page 902 yet. Let's glance at item two. During December, jobs 56, 57, 58 were started. On December 31st, job 58 was unfinished. Ah, that sounds like the ending balance of work in process. This job had charges, debits, for materials of 3,800, labor of 4,800, plus manufacturing overhead. Well, as just a little help, what's the name of this job? One what? 158? 158 has materials and labor already on it. The materials cost were... 3,800, labor was 4,800, did I read that correctly? Mm -hmm. So what was overhead so far on this job? Brandy, 80% of labor. So 80% of 4,800 is, one more time? 3,840. 3,840 auditors. This sum is Jeff, <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> yeah. I need a number. Okay. It's okay, Jeff. I'm just using a number. 12,440? Is that what I'm hearing you say? Yes. 12, gosh, I can't write. 12,440, like this, yes or no? Yes. And that, Jeff, is letter F. F. 12,440. Is it? No, I don't think so. This is the unfinished job. This is the unfinished job. I think it's E. Who's with me at this moment? Come on, let me see. You want to ask me a question? I would love it if you did. Please, Nick? On C, where'd you get 1900? 1900, where did we get 1900? Your materials. Ah, it was down in the manufacturing overhead account. It was labeled indirect materials. The bottom of the page. So, here's how we got that. 18850 left the material storeroom. 1900 was indirect. The rest was direct. Now, I think we're down to one unknown, and you can do the algebra. Yes or no? I, I, I want to do one more. It's a whole lot shorter than this one. I think it would help you. Okay? So, may I erase this? Last call. Let's do one other one real quick. And I want to look at the manufacturing overhead account. So, let's look at manufacturing overhead and tell me whether or not this is true. It looks to me like in manufacturing overhead, 1900 plus L <coughs> plus 1245 minus M is equal to there's nothing in that account that helps me finish that. Look over at item 4 on the top of page 902. Manufacturing overhead was $230 over applied. Is over applied a debit balance or a credit balance in this T account? 
Yeah, I have a nice score. <laughs> a debit balance is described as underapplied. A credit balance is described as overapplied. So, if the balance of this account is credit, I think you'd have to show this as minus 230 equals the ending balance. The beginning balance or the materials labor note, whatever it is, is equal to this ending balance minus 230. Now, I've got two unknowns. You know M? Ah, we did M earlier. 70, 40? Is that the number? M is 70, 40 from applying it. We got one unknown. You should be able to get that. Y'all want to get it real quick? And I've got a check figure here so I can tell you if you got it right. You're solving for L? 3665. One more time? 3665. Hurry. Step right up. I don't have all that. Come on. Aaron, you got me a number? I got 3665. Evan? 3665. You're just saying that. No. Nick? Yeah. It's 3665. Who got it? Hands up. 3665. Did that help a little bit? There's some other relationships here you can do. It'd be good practice. Just get you to think about some of the relationships back in that period of time. Okay? I'm open for more questions. That's it.